What I try to do is uh, to offer a, a diagnostic uh, of uh, the, say, the structure of European problem that date back uh, before uh, uh, before the crisis, placing them uh, in uh, <coughs> in a sort of long term context, trying to uh, analyze the position. The, uh, the European position in terms of uh, uh, scientific capabilities. Here there is um, Patrick Larena with whom uh, we wrote a paper on that, uh, that has been indeed quite successful. I was in a, a, a thesis in a thesis committee yesterday, two days ago, that. Um, uh, the student that presented the thesis on this issue said that well, the Dozi Lerena Sirostabini paper closed the debate on uh, the, in Europe on the relative position of, uh, in science and technology in Europe vis-à-vis uh, -vis the US. Maybe it did not close the debate because uh, in Brussels they did not care. But I think it's important <coughs> to uh, identify the long-term weaknesses um, <clears throat> well before the crisis in research, innovation and production uh, in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, first of all, uh, Europe uh, spend less than our major competitor, uh, our major international competitors uh, in terms of R&D. Um, look at this impressive, uh, this impressive picture with uh, Korea going up, Europe 15 being flat, China coming up very quickly, and we, uh, and Europe, Europe 15, note that if I had Europe 27, the figure would be uh, squeezed down. Uh, because most of the entry are uh, technologically peripheral countries. <coughs> the share of patents has been uh, flat in the very long term and falling over the last 15 years. Patent being, uh, international patent being an indicator uh, of innovative activities. Can you say it? Yes, you can. Uh, Especially in high tech, in the new, in the new promising paradigms, uh, Europe is uh, relatively weak vis-à-vis -vis the United States. Um, the evidence, in fact, uh, highlights a continued U.S. leadership, especially in ICT and your technological paradigm a very fast catch up by the Far East. Um, my mentor Keith Parrott used to say that uh, the American leadership is built uh, on, the American, on two American paranoias about communism and about cancer. And I mean it's a bit extreme but it's not so far away from reality. I mean, uh, the American leadership has been built on a, uh, is a legacy on the big mission oriented program, military space, uh, massive uh, publicly funded research in life sciences, and a rich variety uh, of industrial policies. It is prohibited to call them industrial policy. Uh, and in, in school, you, you read that. Uh, you learn that industrial policies are bad because they mess around with the market. Uh, picking the winner is bad because uh, the government knows less than the private sector. Uh, you have got a very long list uh, of reasons that they teach you in school why should, you should not have industrial policy. Uh, you have massive industrial policy in the United States without, without calling them as such. Um, <coughs> and, uh, of the discretionary type, 
That is those that uh, you read in the books that should never be done. Because the discretionary among the among the better and worse. Because they mess around with private strategies, they distort the market. Uh, in fact, uh, the US always did that. Uh, discretion doctor policy, even at, at the very micro level. Uh, when there was the threat in microelectronics and semiconductors, an apparent Japanese threat, the US government stepped in and said, uh, uh, Dear American producer, uh, you are allowed to get together to violate your antitrust, make the Semtech uh, consortium, we give you money to do joint research, don't care about antitrust because they protect you. Uh, this is a matter of national security, we'll talk about antitrust later on. Um, and that has always been the story. The nanotechnology plan recently. Or uh, th there is a, 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 firm, uh, a firm that built servers, um, including servers for the Pentagon. Um, the Chinese wanted to buy it. And then the American government said, no, sorry, we don't sell it to the Chinese for, for national security reasons. Whether they were right or not, it doesn't matter. But, uh, uh, in any case, we, on the continent, in Europe, had very few mission-oriented program, mission-oriented to repeat our uh, programs that have to do, say, uh, placing the man on the moon. Um, intercontinental uh, uh, strategic multi head missiles. Um, energy saving. Sorry? Energy saving. Energy saving. Uh, that is, I mean, note that this is different, uh, is profoundly different from uh, uh, subsidy to the end, subsidy to R&D. That is the instrument that typically uh, we use in Europe. The, the, the uh, subsidy to the industry is based on the philosophy. I want to mess around as little as possible with the market. The firms know more than I do on, what they on where they would like to innovate, but they don't have the money or the return is too low. Uh, and therefore I give you the money, but you decide whether to put the money. This is a very expensive and highly ineffective way to spend tax taxpayer money. Um, the the mission-oriented thing is, is on the contrary. Uh, I, give you, I give you the money when, uh, to, to produce, say, to place a man on the moon. I want it. I want that object or that, uh, that task fulfilled. I'm ready to pay for it, uh, but I want that, not something else that you decide. And most often, the outcome of this mission uh, are, have uh, uses well beyond the mission itself. Mariana Mazzucato's book is fun, uh, in this is very good because it shows that uh, in a iPhone or whatever, how many components uh, come directly or indirectly from public research, uh, sometimes military, sometimes civil. For example, you know that the uh, um, internet comes directly from, mi from Milnet, and Milnet was the system that was allowing, uh, was built in order to allow uh, the Pentagon and the universe to keep linked uh, even in case uh, of an atomic attack, as if the university would have been there after an atomic attack. But this is, this is another matter. Um, <coughs> I mean, I was a kid when the battle between mission oriented and uh, diffusion oriented. Um, philosophy was fought uh, at TOCD. But it was on one side, there was uh, Pavit, Freeman, Nelson, 
uh, and on the other side there were every arrogance within, within the OECD and not many other people. So I mean in terms of intellectual power, the mission oriented uh, uh, was winning, winning the argument. Well, uh, comes 1982, between say, 1981 and 1984, and the American and British delegate uh, comes in and say, listen, now you stop discussing the, the diffusion of reality as, as one, otherwise I don't give you any money at all. Uh, I declare the battle over and uh, this side as well. And uh, uh, slowly the DSTI, the Directory for Science and Technology and Industry of the USD, was cleaned out of all consultants from Pavit to Freeman to myself to anyone. Uh, and uh, end of the story. There is a myth that uh, uh, Patrick and I and Mauro Silos try to dispel that once uh, it was called, uh, in the 70s it was called uh, the British paradox. Then it became uh, uh, the European paradox. Uh, the story is this. We are so good uh, in, um, in science, we are so competitive uh, in industry, but we are unable to make the bridge. That was the story that was told uh, in England, and then it became the story that justified uh, a, a, a whole generation of uh, uh, blah blah bureaucrats in Brussels to uh, build bridges. Uh, bridges that is uh, uh, University, um, industry committee, joint ventures, uh, um, <coughs> expensive for the taxpayer and totally useless for both industry and the universities. Um, we, uh, Patrick and Diane Mauro, tried to dispel that myth uh, in a paper published on research policy in uh, 2006, and we showed that in fact. Uh, what is weak is not the bridge, are the two, the two, uh, two sides of the, the two sides of the river. That is, uh, we are weaker than the US in science, and we are weaker in terms of participation to the international oligopolis, especially in the newest paradigms uh, in, in production. Um, look at the share of Nobel Prizes. Uh, we, are, we have been falling since the introduction of the Nobel Prize. Maybe. For 90%. Sorry? It was 90%. For 90% and now it's uh, 18. Um, but do we have uh, a leadership uh, in publications, in scientific publication? No. They, uh, whether you normalize, however you normalize with population, with um, number of researchers, uh, we are weaker than the U.S. and we are weaker, especially in the top end, the most cited publication. Uh, we are lagging behind the U.S. Uh, the number uh, of universities in the Shanghai ranking among the top 100, we have uh, half of the US university. Incidentally, Santan is not there either. Eh? And we should do something about it. Well, innovation, note that one could say, well, but who cares? Uh, innovation science is globalized and uh, you can access scientific knowledge everywhere uh, just you click on, uh, on the computer. Now, 
Uh, science is not globalized and innovation is not globalized. People that are following my course know why, because there is a lot of tacitness of knowledge, uh, uh, because uh, uh, is knowledge is not information, <coughs> because uh, if anyone comes to us and gives us the complete proof of the last Fermat theorem, uh, it is information because it's all written down there, but none of us is able to, to know what the hell is going on uh, because we don't have enough knowledge to read the proof of the last Fermat here. Um, this locality of science and innovation is, however, nested in highly globalized economies. Uh, in premise, uh, uh, financial uh, in economies that are financially globalized. Uh, look at this, this graph is impressive. I mean, uh, uh, you have the GDP that grows, but little. Uh, total financial, financial asset, the blue line, explode. So the ratio, say, of financial asset to real GDP, <coughs> which, uh, say, uh, depending on the country, but uh, say until the 70s was something like uh, 1 to 1, 1 and a half to 1, uh, becomes 10 to 1. And, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, not to um, uh, not to see it uh, as a growth of a metastasis in the in the world economy, because of course this makes claims uh, on the real part of the economy. Um, of course. Uh, Globalization mean, is also associated with uh, an increased share in current trade balance and current account on GDP. But much less. Remember that the, uh, the share of trade of world GDP uh, has come back to the values that they were there in 1913, has come back only by the mid 70s. So it is true that uh, uh, import and exports have, have increased uh, their share, but not as much as, uh, not of the same order of magnitude as financial, um, as financial globalization. And uh, Mario has already talked about it. Um, you, this has occurred. Uh, uh, creating increasing imbalances uh, in the um, in the foreign in the, in the foreign account of various countries with uh, essentially the United States that have been growing well above their means one used to say but the United States can do it uh, as long as uh, people accept as a mean of payment uh, pieces of green pieces of paper with written on it I owe you. Uh, as long as the other accept it, uh, they can do it. I mean, I could spend much more if I could print pieces of paper uh, with my signature on it, uh, I owe you. Um, overall, uh, Europe has uh, shrunk in that rate of growth uh, which is consistent with, foreign, with the foreign balance constraint. Europe, Europe 15. Within Europe 15, Germany has grown much less than what was consistent with its foreign balance constraint. Um, Italy has grown more or less in in line with what what the foreign balance constraint uh, was allowing, 
But remember that in turn the foreign balance constraint uh, depends on how competitive the country. So, uh, yes, we have been growing very little because our competitiveness has been low. Um, but more or less on in a balanced way vis-à-vis -vis the foreign account. Um, this is essentially is what, uh, uh, what I was saying before. Europe 27 is grows little. Uh, in a way consistent with its foreign balances. Now the foreign balances are with outside Europe. Uh, <coughs> the US had uh, a, a structural deficit uh, since the Reagan years, uh, and Japan has a, had a structural um, surplus, which is another way of saying that also Japan has been growing less than what is consistent with uh, its foreign bank constraints. Um, well, uh, there has been a, a major displacement uh, also in uh, uh, the, the international distribution uh, of, uh, of manufacturing value added with, uh, as you can imagine, the uh, in a, a spe a spectacular growth uh, of China. Uh, with Europe, uh, or at least parts of Europe, somewhat resisting, but other parts of Europe heavily deindustrializing. De uh, well, these are the same data. On, uh, look, uh, look at the uh, twen uh, this century. China grows uh, uh, altogether in the ten years of the new millennium. Um, manufacturing value added goes 231 percent. At the opposite extreme, the dismal performances are Spain, the United Kingdom, and Italy that shrink. And note that this is uh, mostly before the crisis. Huh? So this, this is a uh, um, uh, this is a structural feature that days, uh, days before the crisis. Well, why, why do we care about, uh, uh, about uh, manufacturing? Uh, apart from the fact that uh, I'm sympathetic to Landini, but uh, why do we care about it? Um, because uh, manufacturing is still uh, the main locus of innovative opportunities. Uh, because it's a major source of dynamic increasing returns. Uh, because uh, manufacturing is providing a large base of decent jobs uh, and is at the core of a uh, uh, relatively egalitarian and inclusive society. And because, finally because it gives a crucial contribution to foreign accounts. Because you don't export personal services, for example, but you export cars or machine tools. Uh, remember, this is important. Uh, remember that uh, um, in, your, uh, in, in the current phase, in the current, uh, and the, the current uh, newer, more dynamic uh, technological paradigms, uh, these new technological paradigms are a negligible source of jobs. I think of uh, um, any industry that is not very competitive, like uh, uh, and belongs to an old paradigm, like the car industry. You take General Motors. General Motors uh, uh, employs directly almost three hundred thousand people, and indirectly probably uh, at least uh, half a million. Uh, Google, that is at the core of the new technological revolution, does not reach 30,000. And most of the R&D activities in manufacturing. 
So this is why we would like to have why the loss of manufacturing is uh, uh, strategic. Now, what happens on the conference? The conference happens that you have take it, the, Wal the Walmart uh, archetype. You know Walmart, this chain of, uh, uh, of supermarket uh, uh, in the US that sell basically everything. But before you had, like mostly we still have in Italy, uh, you have to sell, uh, sell uh, whatever they sell. Uh, this uh, and buying uh, historically from domestic producer that often belong to trade unions. Walmart delocalized the production to China. Uh, now China has turned turn out to be a bit expensive. I mean, labor costs uh, are getting too high, and uh, so they delocalize in Vietnam. And uh, <coughs> so you have got a destruction of good jobs in the US, the creation of cheap jobs in China, an increase in imports, well yes, a little bit of a fall in consumer prices, uh, you have for those co US consumers that however now have lower income, because now they do a shitty job in Walmart or, uh, or cleaning somewhere. And you've got an enormous explosion of Walmart prices. A Walmart profit, profit sorry. Uh, I think that the Walmart archetype is, uh, captures uh, a, a major tendency uh, in the world economy. Um, what are the consequences of uh, the pattern of technical change that I was describing before? Globalization, deindustrialization, financialization, well, one is growing inequality. No and Mario has already talked about it. Um, <coughs> what can be done about that, about all that? Uh, but all that, all that meaning also, meaning uh, also the, those long-term structural causes that we were talking about before. Huh? Um, well, we can do what we are doing now, that is nothing, uh, and uh, witness uh, uh, a further weakening of the manufacturing base, low rate of growth uh, and increasing inequality. Uh, note uh, that what I'm going to say here uh, has a premise uh, on what, what can be done, has a premise uh, that one has got to do also the macro policies that Mario was talking before. Uh, so, I mean, you cannot do anything of what I'm going to suggest in a regime of uh, austerity. Um, uh, one needs to manage globalization, uh, to have active science policies in Europe. Um, uh, active science policy means uh, having uh, something like uh, the National Science Foundation and National Institute of Health. Uh, means. Uh, um, decreases the emphasis, decreasing the emphasis of science industry links uh, and emphasize uh, the uh, op open science driven by curiosity. Uh, equivalent to uh, Apollo military space program. And uh, an obvious uh, an obvious area is the environment. Massive program like sequestration of CO2, I don't know. Ambitious and long term. I don't know whether sequestration is feasible or not, I mean, I'm not an expert, but. Uh, there are better things. Sorry? Reduction of emissions, that's right. Uh, reduction of emissions, but probably is not enough. Uh, we are probably already the 
Some Russian mission is obviously uh, to be done, but maybe it's not a, a totally pragmatic use of competition policy. Um, competition policy are a luxury that you can afford uh, when, uh, when you are a winner. Otherwise, uh, you might as well uh, strengthen European champions uh, <coughs> and think later of competition policy. The idea that competition makes firm innovate more is a pie in the sky. There is no evidence. Uh, strengthening European ventures. Uh, I'm a uh, Sometimes people call me a left-wing military. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, I mean, of course, I'm uh, I'm all in favor first uh, to to spend the money on uh, uh, hospitals, schools. Uh, uh, but if there is some money left over, uh, I would not mind, for example, uh, putting more money on uh, the fighter bomber version of the. Uh, European Eurofighter, Tornado Eurofighter, and stop uh, the financing of the F-35. The F-35 it is a, an airplane that the Americans don't want. The Pentagon does not want uh, the F-35. There is a report by the Rand Corporation uh, that when it talks about the F-35, the title of the report is does not fight, does not swerve, does not fly. <laughs> uh, and we keep pouring money there. So the only mission is a failed mission of someone else. Uh, we, you won't have a taxation of financial rents, including but not only Tobin taxes. <coughs> Tobin taxes, you know, uh, it are, uh, is a tax on transaction in foreign exchanges, but you could have on all financial transaction. And then you say, if you know, it's technically possible. I mean, you make all the transaction go through uh, the central bank, say. Um, and every transaction pays little, a little, but a little, given the amount of of financial assets that we saw before, you go a very long way. Heavy progressive taxation in general. Uh, stopping the race to the bottom in European fiscal policy so that uh, uh, Luxembourg uh, makes a uh, sweet, uh, sweet deal uh, with the multinational to place there. The Brits do the same. Uh, Ireland does the same. And so the, the tax base is shrink. The latest example is Fiat in London. Fiat now is not Fiat, it's car. <laughs> uh, well, look at the story of the margin, marginal tax rates uh, in the US. Uh, when, when I give a speech in the US on these things, uh, uh, I like uh, uh, to provoke the audience, I remember when, uh, <coughs> I, was, uh, I was giving this, this speech at the, uh, similar speech at the uh, graduate school of, uh, um, graduate, graduate school, graduate college of the U.S. Navy, uh, and I asked them, uh, did, did you know that you had uh, a communist uh, president? Everyone looked at me, like, are you out of your mind? I said, yes. General Eisenhower, had the marginal taxation at 92% on personal income. Long live camera dies an hour. Um, <clears throat> and you can, you can see that it has been falling uh, since, essentially, uh, since Nixon. Dramatically, then in, uh, in, uh, in the 80s. And uh, well, the, the, other, the other tax, uh, the, the one before was the marginal tax rate. This is the average tax rate. And you can see that it kept falling. Uh, it kept falling especially 
not even for the top 1%, but for the top 0,1%. Uh, because the skewness is, uh, a lot of the skewness of the distribution is in the top 1%, but also in the top 10% of the 1% and in the top 100%. Uh, 10% of the 10% of the 1%. So there is an enormous skewness out there. Uh, corporate tax rates have been falling too. Note uh, that, I mean, there is the argument uh, uh, you cannot tax profits uh, because you tax investment and you reduce growth. Uh, the period of highest growth throughout the, Amer the whole American history has been when, the, when taxes were the highest. And in fact, I mean, if you go and also look at microdata, uh, I, we have looked at the microdata uh, on Italy, on France, on the US, there is no correlation between profitability and firm growth. No correlation. So you cannot make the claim that uh, uh, you've got to allow the bosses to uh, make a lot of money otherwise they don't invest. They make it, those that make a lot of money, it is for uh, the house in St. Maurice, the house in Portofino, uh, their mistresses, their cocaine, but not for investment and therefore can be taxed. Uh, even, more even more controversial. Uh, I think that uh, globalization should be managed also in terms of uh, uh, trade flows. Uh, in order to keep a good chunk of manufacturing in Europe itself. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, otherwise are, are very expensive but very good welfare system could survive. Uh, I'm not, uh, I think that if anyone thinks that uh, the Chinese worker will pay my pension, they are out of their mind. They don't, they don't have their, their own pension while well, they should pay my pension. Uh, I think the pragmatic use of tariffs and quotas, I know that now people say, say this is the horror, but I think would help also the Chinese workers, because it forced China to reflate and increase internal demand instead of being, being driven by export. Um, one could have uh, uh, pollution related taxes, uh, tariffs modulated on uh, union protection of workers, saying, well, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't allow unions, uh, sorry, we'll, uh, we'll charge you more uh, on the imports. Um, that I realize that that uh, is not a measure that can be in, undertaken by Italy alone, but uh, has got to be at least European because it means messing around with the, uh, the entire WTO system. But I think in the long term, uh, if we want Europe as a Europe to survive with this welfare system, I, uh, I cannot see many other, many other way out. And there are <coughs> Other things to be avoided at all cost, uh, like the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Uh, this is something, this is, mind you, it's difficult to say what it is because it's negotiated secretly. Uh, just English was telling me that uh, the US Senate does not know what is, what is negotiated. Uh, but Obama went to the Congress and said, uh, for the other one with, with Japan, 
say I want a, a, a fast lane for this I'm not going to tell you what it is but then when I come to the Congress you just say take it or leave it you cannot change it uh, what we know is that uh, uh, it protects pr private investment uh, above uh, political and social interests. Um, so you can have, so for example, this will, uh, your uh, transatlantic partnership will most likely mean that we are forced to get the, the American OGM we are forced to get the American meat fed with antibiotics and hormones. Um, we cannot have uh, uh, the cultural protection for French films. Um, we cannot introduce uh, 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 discriminatory, that is, uh, effective uh, environmental legislation. And not only that, but if there is a controversy, between, say, a multinational and the state, this uh, will go to a private arbitrate. So it is uh, the privatization of international law. Uh, this is something that has got to be avoided at all costs. Um, to repeat, and, and I end here, all this has a necessary condition in all the, measure, in all the macro measures that uh, uh, Mario was talking about. And it is impossible to do this measure under condition of austerity, for example. Uh, these measures are expensive. Uh, and in fact, this measure could be part of a huge Keynesian package to pull Europe out of recession. Yeah.